various artifacts related to the history of this uh, uh, republic. Is the government house in Minsk still there? Um, yeah, the, 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 the building actually exists. Um, and um, incidentally, it was given recently to the Russian Orthodox Church. And they was, they've installed an onion dome on it. But the building is there, yeah. And some... Uh, uh, Untowned uh, flags in uh, Rodno. After uh, Minsk was taken over by the Red Army of Soviet Russia, the the seat of the government moved on to Rodno, which was kind of uh, no one's land at the time uh, in terms of the of the parties at war. What I mean that the, the Germans uh, left their own uh, uh, police at the time, so there was some law and order. And uh, the uh, the uh, Belarusian Democratic Republic's um, government um, entered into, into, into an agreement with uh, Lithuania, and uh, so there was a, a some some units of Belarusian um, uh, cavalry uh, formed in Rodna, so they uh, did control it uh, for, for 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 some for some time, and uh, this shows the uh, the seat of the of the military governor from Belarus uh, in Hrodno. <laughs> so, so they consider the French flag. So after the uh, German Revolution, the, the mission from uh, Entente has arrived, the, the, the France and, uh, uh, and Great Britain too, I think. Here are some stamps. Uh, the, the top three stamps are from the Belarusian Dem Democratic Republic itself and the Bottom five are from the field post. The military. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this this part uh, is um, dedicated to a Belarusian poet, uh, Larisa Yenish. Larisa Yenish was a very important uh, Belarusian poet. Um, and um, she uh, lived in Prague. Uh, her her, her husband was a doctor uh, during the Second World War. And uh, she, when uh, in 1943, uh, the president of the uh, Belarusian Democratic Republic in exile, uh, Zaharka, um, was in, some, in very poor health, and he signed a decree uh, by which he um, gave the authority to uh, Mikola Abramczyk and Larisa Yenish to reconstitute the Rada after the war. Um, Abramczyk um, was uh, basically exiled by, by the Germans uh, who were not very happy about all these political things uh, and he, had to, uh, he was uh, living in, in Paris for the rest of the war under the surveillance of uh, Gestapo. But Yenius um, remained in Prague. And then, in May uh, 1945, the Soviet army arrived in Prague. And, uh, of course, she was, um, she was stripped of her uh, Czech citizenship, Czechoslovakian citizenship, and immediately arrested and exiled um, to the Soviet Union, extradited, basically, to the Soviet Union where she received a very long uh, prison um, uh, term in prison sentence in uh, Gulag. In 1981, uh, her son, who used to live in Poland, donated her, um, her dress from the uh, Gulag concentration camp, which she brought with her all the way from from Gulag, and she was released in the uh, uh, mid 1950s after the death of Stalin. It's, as I said, it's very, it's very, it's very cold, um, very cold uh, uh, rope for for Siberia. And here are some the documents which are 
related to her, uh, her work and life. And this is the, the collection of her poems published in Nazi occupied Czechoslovakia, and that was the main that was the main charge against her in the Soviet Union that she she published something um, under the German authorities under the German occupation and uh, in the eyes of the Soviet Union that made her a collaborator. But of course, the the the, the main underlying uh, reason for her um, persecution was that. She was one of the per of the two persons to whom the president of the Rada of the Belarusian Democratic uh, Republic in exile uh, gave the authority to um, restart the operation of the Rada in exile after the war. And whatever happened to her? Did she? Uh, so she went to live in in <laughs> Europe afterwards. No, no. She she. Uh, it was not possible to leave from the Soviet Union. So when she, uh, re uh, she was released from uh, Gulag, she, uh, she settled in a small town in Belarus, and um, she never accepted uh, Soviet citizenship. She, um, she, she, she thought it was a great injustice, injustice uh, down that she was stripped of her Czechoslovakian citizenship, and. Uh, she never, she never became a Soviet citizen, and she died uh, in the 1970s, I think, in the 1980s uh, or late 1970s um, in Belarus without ever becoming a Soviet citizen. Um, and um, at the time, of course, Belarus and uh, um, what is now the Republic of Lithuania formed a single country. A single country with two um, elements um, speaking different languages. However, it was a single country. It was like a, a Highland and Lowland Scotland. Had different languages, a single kingdom. Um, this is, for example, a, a, a map published in 1633. And this is the map of the, um, of the territory which was claimed, albeit just politically claimed, by the Belarusian Democratic Republic. Uh, the Belarusian Democratic Republic was declared independent in um, uh, March 1918. Um, it tried to set up a proper working uh, state. However, it was um, it, 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 the problem it had. It did not have any allies, any foreign allies. It had um, a de facto recognition from Finland, for example. Uh, various other foreign governments did enter in various forms of official relations without granting uh, a full de facto de, de jure uh, recognition. Um, and the, the, uh, uh, the German government, who controlled that area during the First World War, refused to recognize that um, as an independent country because uh, it signed uh, the treaty, the peace treaty of Brest, in which it promised to the Soviet, um, uh, to Soviet Russia that it, it would not recognize any new countries. So um, uh, the Belarusian Democratic Republic um, found itself completely defenseless when the Germans, uh, after the German Revolution, began to withdraw from the area and the Red Army of, uh, of uh, Soviet Russia arrived from the east. So on the 10th of December 1918, uh, the capital, uh, Minsk, was taken over by the Red Army of Soviet Russia and the government and the parliament of the Belarusian Democratic Republic uh, went into exile. Um, the government per se actually ceased operating uh, in mid-1920s, but the pre-parliament, uh, what's called the Rada, has continued to operate and exists still today. Um, because um, last year there was the 100th anniversary, 
the artifacts you can see here are specifically dedicated to the history of the Belarusian Democratic Republic. Here, for example, is a photograph of the consulate of the Belarusian Democratic Republic in, uh, in Istanbul or Constantinople, as it was called uh, in Europe at the time. And the premises were shared with the consulate of Lithuania and Estonia. Um, here you can see uh, various visiting cards from the president, um, from, the, from the chair of the Council of Ministers, and various officials. And these are two of the uh, presidents of the Belarusian Democratic Republic in exile, and both of them lived and died in Prague. <laughs> so what was the government system like there? Was it uh, Christian, democratic? Oh, it was both. I think uh, it, it was, uh, was multi-partial. There were different parties. At the time, most of the parties were of various uh, socialist-leaning uh, nature. Uh, some were more sort of social democratic, some of them were um, agricultural socialist. Um, they, were, they were no right-wing parties. Uh, the, the most uh, right-wing you could find would probably be sort of Christian Democrat, but the Belarusian variety, the Belarusian variety of Christian Democrats was also very much socialist-leaning. And the reason for that was the, the majority of the population who uh, were identified as, as Belarusians were mostly uh, peasants. So they had to be responsible to their own constituency. Um, here is a passport, um, one of the passports um, of the Belarusian Democratic Republic. <laughs> and. Um, you can see the portrait of the owner and uh, of his wife, in fact. <laughs> and the last, last page shows a lot of uh, uh, border guard um, stamps and visas um, and residence permits. Um, this passport was actually used to immigrate to the United States of America. And it, I mean, it was successfully used to immigrate. Um, which just shows that although this, this republic did not get any official recognition, its passports were officially recognized by a lot of countries as a, as a valid travel document. Um, and I see it says 1922 on one of the stamps. That was several years after the country had fallen. Yeah, because, because the consulates and embassies and diplomatic missions went on in exile. Uh, the same happened to, to the Baltic states. I mean, the, the, the Estonian, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Estonian fossil, fo fossil um, embassy, as they, they used to be called, um, has existed all the way and uh, had existed all the way until the fall of the Soviet Union um, in London. Uh, so they also um, operated uh, the embassy, the, the diplomatic missions operated uh, where they were tolerated, as it were, um, for a number of years. Uh, Sashes. Uh, these were basically used as belts, as sashes, uh, part of the traditional noble uh, dress. They were uh, manufactured using silk and uh, uh, metallic threads. And um, part of the tradition was that after the death of the owner, they would donate that uh, sash to the Catholic Church, and then the, the Catholic priest would uh, cover it up and um, make a, a, a church dress out of it. And um, the, the lot of those has uh, survived, but very few of, of sashes. And, and here are just some other artifacts um, from the religious um, history. This was owned by a Belarusian priest who was in Gulag, and he uh, created this uh, uh, for serving <coughs> uh, Holy Mass. Um, in Grandestine. In, yeah. Grandestine. In, in, in Gulag. <laughs>
And there's also a collection of, of uh, um, old dresses and uh, historical and historical church rooms. Some of them are quite old. So this, as I say, was um, created as an auxiliary, um, as an auxiliary uh, institution to the library, just for anyone who would come to the library would know nothing about Belarus. Uh, this gives you some, some, some snapshot, some of its history, some idea of what the country was generally like, um, from which you can find all the books downstairs. But this is. It does give you some, some context, the main, the main collection of the books is. And um, here's the, the reference uh, section, and um, uh, here is uh, the, the section of, the, uh, of those <coughs> books which, have, which are sort of newly arrived. For, they come either from Belarus or Poland or from uh, wherever something could have been published in, in the Belarusian uh, language or on a subject um, relevant to uh, Belarus. Nowadays, uh, the library gets not just everything, but a very uh, careful selection of uh, books. Um, but just uh, to give you an idea of what's, what's there, for example, this will be A very important newspaper called Nasha Niva uh, from um, 1912. Um, it was published originally in the Latin and Cyrillic script, and then at some point they decided uh, it was too expensive, and they decided to go on just in the Cyrillic script, but <coughs> um, not in 1912. Um, this newspaper was a very important uh, cultural phenomenon. It was published for, for, for a number of years as the main um, sort of uh, the main, it almost became a, a, an institution in its own right <coughs> as, as a newspaper. Uh, then it was discontinued after the Soviet takeover and then it was revived in around uh, 1990 and still is, uh, is, is published today, albeit in a digital form only. <laughs> um, so the after, especially after the Second World War, uh, Belarusian diaspora um, uh, emerged in a lot of Western countries, uh, in Europe, as well as uh, in the United States and Canada, and in places like Brazil, uh, that kind of thing. And um, they, they would often uh, go on publishing some periodicals of local uh, news and, and general sort of Belarusian uh, papers of some kind. And uh, <coughs> the uh, founders of this library were very focused on uh, keeping track of, what's, of what is being published by the diaspora. And uh, uh, this is how the library became probably the best collection of that kind of material um, anywhere in the world. The library could um, order anything um, of interest uh, relevant to Belarus from the Soviet Union. They could also order um, uh, the microfilms of uh, early printed books related to the history of uh, Belarus, which uh, were not available in Belarus itself, but would be mostly uh, held in the libraries of Moscow and uh, uh, what is now St. Petersburg and then was called Leningrad. But the Soviet Union was very happy to sell uh, the microfilms, uh, produce and sell microfilms from um, whatever <coughs> um, early printed books uh, that uh, were of interest. And this is how this library also became the largest collection of such microfilms in the world. Um, the technology is, of course, uh, is, is slightly outdated today, and it requires digitizing. However, um, it's, it's, it's there. This is a history of religion 
um, various things related to Belarus, either the Union Church or the Orthodox or the Catholic Church, or indeed uh, the Lutheran Church and Calvinists and uh, uh, various <coughs> uh, uh, sort of say, denominations and um, confessions that uh, were uh, uh, that existed in Belarus. Uh, it is, of course, it's, it's uh, because of the nature of this religious institution. It's uh, it's been focused on the Union uh, Church history, but because uh, this is this was the religious institution, the this is the core, the original core collection because this was the main interest of the priests. Um, there was, uh, for example, a um, a newspaper which was published. Um, in the Vatican from uh, 1959 to something like 1970, um, this, those three three volumes are um, a, a journal, a Belarusian religious journal, which was published in Paris uh, over a few decades. Uh, there's also a collection on Belarusian religious uh, music. Um, <coughs> there was um, uh, a gentleman called uh, Guy Picard uh, who was uh, an expert in uh, in religious uh, music, and he was the person who um, was responsible for putting together uh, mm -hmm. a very good collection of uh, Belarusian religious uh, music. It's not just. Um, Catholic or Orthodox, there's, there's something on Methodist Church because there were Methodist communities in uh, uh, Western Belarus uh, during the interwar period. <laughs>